Good evening everyone, it's six o'clock and I declare this agenda forum open. I'd like to start by uh, stating the City of Swan acknowledges traditional custodians of the area in which we meet tonight, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and we acknowledge their continuing connection to the land, waters and community. We also pay our respects to their elders past, present and their descendants. I welcome uh, all councillor staff and members of the public in the gallery. And item two is the disclaimer. The terms and condition of entry into this meeting are posted at the entry of the public gallery. Members of the public are asked to read them uh, prior to attending and to abide by them. Item three, attendance and apologies. I have uh, Councillor <coughs> Singh and Pradovnik are apologies tonight. Councillor Henderson <coughs> on, his, on leave of absence. And I've had a request from Councillor Johnson to lend, uh, attend electronically. This has caused a little bit of... Um, concern for me, um, but uh, in the interest of fairness, he completed the application form to attend this meeting. Uh, he has provided a specific location which he wants to remain confidential, um, so I'm prepared to accept that. Um, other than that, I believe all other councillors are present, other than those on leave. Item four, uh, declarations of financial and proximity interest and interest affecting the impartiality. And just before I go, when Councillor Johnson filled out his declaration, he declared that he is able to maintain confidentiality during the meeting in accordance with the Local Government Administration Regulations 1996. Um, item four, declarations of any financial proximity or interest in affecting <coughs> impartiality. Are there any councillors or staff? Mr Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a declaration of interest from Councillor Aaron Bowman uh, relating to item 3.2, uh, the Ellenbrook Eastern Tea Ball Club. It's an impartiality interest. Uh, the reason given is that my daughter plays tea ball for Ellenbrook Easterns, and my wife and I are active volunteers uh, with the club. Thank you. Are there any others? Being no more, that takes us on to item five. Public question times, questions relating to reports contained in the agenda and 5.1, questions which were taken on uh, notice, there's nil. 5.2, questions without notice. Are there any questions for members in the gallery about any item on this agenda? Being no questions, we'll go on to item six, reports and notices of motion. 6.1, I'd like uh, councillors to note that there's additional information from officers on item 3.4, the updated local emergency management arrangements. Uh, that item's on page 40, but the update's on page 43, and uh, is simply stating that the uh, voting requirements is a simple majority, not an absolute majority. So you can just amend uh, your um, agendas accordingly in due course. Takes us to item 6.2, deputations, and in accordance with the current procedures for public participation at agenda forums, all requests for in-person deputations were required by 10am today, the 3rd of May, and all written deputations received by 3pm yesterday were circulated with the preliminary agenda on Tuesday evening. So part A, there were no deputations. In part B, there is a number. And the first item in part B, it's on page 31. It's item 3.2, annual meeting of electors motion 22, Allenbrook Eastern Tea Ball and Softball Club. The in-person deputation will be given by Mr. Gary Wepner, the president of the club. And uh, Mr. Wepner, you'll have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Okay, and just before you start, I've just been asked, uh, Councillor Johnson, can you hear us? And I just want to make sure that we can hear you. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary, if you can please proceed. Uh, good evening. 
Um, item 3.2 on the agenda, motion 22 from the electors meeting. Um, I would like to contest the City of Swan's suggestion of storage option two under financial implications as stated in that report. Firstly, on behalf of the club, I would like to thank the staff of City of Swan for all their efforts and considerations that's been put into this motion for securing our club a home ground. However, the storage requirements for our club are and have always been a priority when assessing and reviewing the home ground options. Woodlake Oval was one of the options, but when Coolamont Oval became our preferred option, we were advised by the Additions and Alterations Department of the City of Swan to resubmit our request for a sea container for storage with the amendment being from Woodlake to Coolamont. This form was completed and resubmitted. It was always a necessity for our club due to the large volume of heavy equipment that requires mobilizing on game days, such as 20 gazebos, 16 fold out benches, eight fold out tables and chairs, 24 sponsors, three meter banners, etc. All this equipment needs to be mobilized onto the oval from an on-site storage facility. As for little athletics on the same site from a storage container adjacent to the oval. We see this being facilitated with the possible use of a golf type buggy. There are currently two six meter sea containers on site adjacent to the oval for the use of by Little Athletics. Um, we are requiring one additional six meter con container to be placed alongside these two. The current estimation of $29,000, we agree for a six month temporary installation would appear costly. However, we require it to be a permanent installation and not temporary. And this would then mean that the cost could be amortized over many years. Having said that, I must say $29,000 for the installation of a six meter container does seem to be excessive. Neither the containers at Coolamon for Little Athletics, nor the one currently at Woodlake for Rugby have any permanent installation features. The two at Coolamon are just on the grass and the one at Woodlake is just placed on bricks. There are no earthworks or concrete pad installations for those. So in conclusion, our club would like to proceed with our original request for a six meter sea container to be placed at Coolamon Oval adjacent to the two that already exist there. From an aesthetics aspect, the two that are already on site are hidden from the road and nearby houses by trees and shrubs. The placing of another container adjacent to these two would have no further detrimental effect from the public's point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Are there any questions, councillors? Uh, Councillor Bowman first. Councillor McCulloch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Um, Gary, thank you for your deputation. So you're saying that that one six metre sea container um, on the site will enable you to provide what you need to in a, an easier easier way for yes. that period so of time. As a club, we, with the, the club sharing process, which we've all agreed to, there are three clubs there currently, yeah. um, us, Little Athletics and Hockey. Um, we've all agreed to sort of coexist for a period of time until uh, we believe hockey are moving on in about two seasons' time. Right. City of Swan seemed to think that, well, the suggestion is that we would then take over the storage room that hockey currently occupy in the main pavilion. But that won't assist us because the, the amount of equipment we have needs to be mobilized down onto the oval. So we would need to, you know, currently have it in a fairly large trailer. Um, and the idea would be to take that trailer to the oval so we can unload the gear as required. Okay, I get that with event equipment, it is um, far more practicable in those capacities. Okay, that does explain it. And thank you, Mr. Murrell. I'll probably be advised of moving an alternative. 
to accommodate this. Thank you, Councillor Bohm. You had questions? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Gary, you sort of touched on it. Um, obviously, the club hasn't had a home for two years. Um, it's been a bit of a process to get through. Where's, where's the, all the storage happen now? Um, storage currently is spread across several of the committee members' um, home premises. So we pretty much all bring stuff to the Oval on a game day. And that involves a couple of trailers, bringing all the gear down to the school Oval where we currently play. So, you know, if we're going to look at a home ground facility, obviously we need to eliminate this carting of equipment from, the, from a volunteer's point of view because it might end up that we might lose those members if we have to continue on with this process. And you mentioned there's already two shipping containers down there. Are you aware of whether they're both full or...? Um, we're un we've been advised that they are both used by Little Athletics. Okay, and I've got questions of staff, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Um, Councillor Howlett, you had a question? Thank you for your deputation. Um, you mentioned that using a golf buggy to get the equipment from the sea container to the areas on the ground that you needed, is that what you were... Well, that, that's a, possibil a possibility. Ideally, we'd like to maintain one of the larger trailers that we already have inside a container, and then that would probably give us most of the equipment that we could then move down onto the oval. Um, what we've seen in other venues, such as the Swan Athletic Sporting Club, is they have a similar type of little buggy that then brings trailer loads of equipment down onto the oval rather than using a you know a, a full-blown uh, vehicle as such okay so do you have such buggy no 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 but well, we, we would acquire one of those fairly quickly yeah okay thank you councillor richardson you have a question uh, thank you mr mayor uh, just another quick question and in terms of uh, the buggy if the sea container wasn't an option, how many trailer loads do you have to do with the if the possible golf club? Like, how many trailer loads do you have to do to get the gear out and in with that one? Well, with with, with one of the trailers that we have, we, the majority of the equipment would be in a single trailer. Mm -hmm. um, it's just currently we you know we load up two or three um, utes as well to get gear down to the current school oval that we're so you've using. So got a trailer already? Yes. And that would be, you'd park that in the sea container as well? Yes. Okay, just checking. And what's the size of that trailer? I think it's, uh, I'd have to confirm. I'm not, it is a double axle. Okay. But I'm not exactly, sure. actually, no, sorry, no, it's a single axle, but I'm not sure of the exact size. Okay. And so how many trips are you doing at the moment currently, like actually from, say, that position when the vehicles come with their utes and... Oh, no, well, it's just it's just one, one trip because we managed to get probably six vehicles and the trailer okay. down to the school oval on a Sunday morning. And what sort of time frame does that take to get the gear out and onto the oval? Um, well, we're, we're there from about half past six in the morning and first game is at eight o'clock. So we make sure that everything's prepared within that hour and a half. But actually getting the gear out, how long does it take you when it's all loaded on those trailers and the utes that will yeah. come to um, actually get out? Oh, probably uh, half, half an hour to three quarters of an hour. Worries. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Are there any other questions of Mr. Wepner? Then I thank you for your deputation. Gary, Councillor Bowman, you've got uh, some staff questions. I have, okay. Mr. Thank, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can staff uh, explain why it cost 29000 and why they thought it would only be for a six months period? Mr. Bishop? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the reason for the six-month estimation is based on the anticipated time frame for when the hockey club would relocate and the time between when now and when we would be able to get a sea container established on the site. So it's an estimate that there might only be in the order of six months between the two. I think the second question was related to the cost. I can't, I'll have to take that on notice and give you a further breakdown, uh, Council, in regards to cost, but that's that's obviously the, a cost that staff provide. Next. Next question is the two shipping containers that are currently there, how long have they been there for? Um, through you, Mr Mayor, I'd have to take that on notice. Next question, Mr Mayor. Um, is it the same rules for all sporting clubs to storage or depending on what sport and what sporting club you are, are there different rules? 
Mr Bishop. Um, through you, Mr Mayor, I mean, it's, it's assessed in the context of the sporting clubs. We try and endeavour to provide storage within the actual built form of the facility wherever possible. That's inherent in the design. But obviously what we come across is many situations where the storage is insufficient for some clubs or the multiple users of clubs. And that's where additional storage is often ends up being brought in, such as described this evening. Mr Mayor, my next question is, we heard from the deputation that they put in the additions and alterations form um, for a sea container. Um, can we just uh, check that that's been received and what's happened with that? Mr Bishop, through you, Mr Mayor, we certainly can. So is that is that being looked at or is... <clears throat> Mr Bishop, through you, Mr Mayor, it's standard practice, the process for the city, that where any organisation is seeking any alterations or additions to a facility to fill out that form. That's the process to start the discussions with the city, a feasibility assessment of what's needed. So I'm sure such a form has been filled out and that's probably started the discussions. Okay, and final question, Mr Mayor, which is going to port, not so much about storage. Why has it taken so long for us as a council, as a, a city, to come to this conclusion to allow this club to use the oval when it wasn't getting used when staff previously said no to them? Mr Bishop, um, I think uh, as Mr Weppner highlighted, I think the club's been in existence for a couple of years. Um, I, I can't recall when discussions first started. Mr Mayor, I'm happy to take that on notice. Just after the uh, annual meeting of electors where Mr Whitner moved a uh, successful motion and I invited him to come and have a meeting with the City of Swan uh, perhaps a, a few weeks after that. Mr Mayor, I'd just like to... That's incorrect. Uh, that's when I believe the club was frustrated for no action and so they had to bring something to annual electors meeting and then you met with... That's the, within my knowledge. We met with the club. It's been going on for quite some time <laughs> and the staff said no... My understanding is because one club didn't want to share an oval who weren't even using it on Sunday. So why why was that denied and now is being approved? What's changed? Mr Bishop, through you, Mr Mayor, what's changed is all the clubs have agreed to an arrangement where they can co-share the facility. So then my follow-on question is, does a club is allowed, who's a current user, to prevent another club from using an oval when they don't use it. So my understanding is one club didn't want them to use the oval on a Sunday, although that club does not use the oval on a Sunday. Mr Bishop, um, through you, Mr Mayor, no, it doesn't give a right to any club to refuse access, but we seek to negotiate a suitable outcome with all clubs. In this situation, there was protracted negotiations on the matter. And initially, we couldn't get an agreement or a position that would work for all clubs. But further negotiations led to an outcome that was satisfactory for all clubs. And obviously, we, we seek to ensure that there is harmony in the operations between all clubs and such facilities. Finish, Councillor Bowman. Councillor Catalano, you've got questions to start? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, what are the chances of getting that container put on there permanently? Mr Bishop, um, I guess it comes down through you, Mr Mayor, what you determine as permanent. Obviously, a, a lot of sea containers end up being in locations for extended periods. OK, for there the is... length of time that the club... Uh, this particular club yes. is using that particular that's, oval. That's the assumption we'd be working on, that it would be there for the life of the club until at least such time as any additions or extensions are made to the main facility. That would provide, obviously, an opportunity to reconsider the storage needs. And is storage an issue at that particular oval, generally speaking? So if another user was to use that um, oval and let's just say the table vacated, uh, would would another club uh, more than likely use that storage space? It's just that I, I do know that even the soccer clubs uh, at, at Russia Park uh, complain about lack of storage space. So it seems to be quite an issue. Mr. Bishop, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, storage is a common issue in facilities at a, a number of locations. Mm -hmm. As I understand it here, notwithstanding that the hockey club will be relocating and that will provide significant storage within the building, the specific needs of this club 
is they're seeking to store a trailer and a mobile vehicle that enables them to take their equipment out simply and effectively. Um, I think that's arguably the key difference here. There's no other questions. And thank you. We'll move on to the next item, which is item 3.3, annual meeting electors motion 24, Allenbrook United Football Club. It's on page 35 of your agenda. Have an in-person deputation for Mr. Mark Angia. Thank you, Mark. You'll have five minutes and then you'll be followed up by Andrew. Uh, thank you. Just for the record, uh, Andrew Lupus, the treasurer of Ellenbrook United Football Club, is uh, come down sick, so he won't be attending tonight, unfortunately. Um, I've included his couple of details in my report, so um, that's fine. Um, I want I needed to address on behalf of the foot club, football club, sorry, um, in my role as the president of the club, the inaccuracies that have been put into the. Um, uh, all of the paperwork which is going to be presented to yourselves next week, so uh, at the council meeting. Um, myself and the secretary of the club met with uh, the two representatives of council uh, on March 2 to go through how we can achieve what we need to achieve in the best interest of Elmbrook United Football Club and, this, and the city. Um, the On page three of our... Um, uh, document, if you like, um, the in the highlighted, there's a, um, sorry, when I refer to page three, does everyone know what that means? Or I'm sorry. <laughs> Is that up there? No. Okay. So in the, in the agenda item um, on page three, there is a list of three items in there which address season booking, pro, uh, pre and post season booking and priority bookings. Um, in our discussions, the season booking, um, the outcome written by the city's staff uh, says that the city applies a seasonal booking process as it does to clubs across the city. EFC agree to the, agree this process works well for seasonal training and games fixtures as they follow a regular schedule year to year. Um, couldn't be anything further from the truth, otherwise I wouldn't have wasted my time nor your time in coming and asking for an extra season booking. Um, for that point, the um, uh, we need to know where we stand in the city's eyes. Our season does not run for six months. It actually runs for some nine months, and that doesn't even include pre-season games and things like that. Ellenbrook United, uh, oh, sorry, uh, DOS South Fields are soccer pitches. Um, city has tried to utilise them for other sports, and it hasn't worked. Um, there's a couple of other sports that are referenced in here. I think one is Frisbee. That would probably work on the pitches. Never seen it happen, but if it, if it can happen, that's great. Ellenbrook United actually promote the pitches on behalf of City of Swan inadvertently. So um, also on that same page three, there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 11 other users that have used the pitch in the last 12 months. Uh, nine of those users, Ellenbrook United Football Club have brought in and directed straight to the city. So we contribute um, an awful lot for the pitch. The main reason there is no summer booking for that pitch is because you can't walk on the pitch in the summer. Typically when an AstroTurf or synthetic, whatever you would like to call it, pitch is built, it's built with a sprinkler system in it, um, which sort of goes against a lot of the reasons for building AstroTurf because um, you want to be good for the environment and safe water. However, when it's 35 degrees, it's 45 degrees on the pitch. So let alone children, adults can't even walk on it. So hence, in summer, during the day, the pitches can't be used. They're, they lay dormant, um, as you're probably all well aware, or maybe you're not. So in turn, we can use them at night time, of course, because it does uh, cool down dramatically. Um, in that point, um, soccer has changed and evolved in Australia um, in, a, in a hugely, if you like, dramatic form that if you go back four, five years, soccer was a five-month sport. Um, now it's an 11-month sport. So our kids don't do two sports now. They do one sport. So we used to have a soccer, a, a winter and a, a summer sports. They can't because they're, our soccer season actually goes longer than our booking season just our physical games, that is. Um, and it's on the Football West site. 
actually gives you all the schedules and where our games are and everything. So hence, that is why we brought to yourselves, after speaking to staff on site, um, about having an extended season. The main criteria out of the meeting that we had on the 2nd of March was that council would uh, entertain Ellenbrook United holding a summer booking. It's a pretty easy thing. I mean, we don't want to use it during the day. Um, however, it gives us a summer booking and a winter booking. So a lot of sports do have that as well through the city. Um, that sort of made sense because it fits in with the existing council structure. The, we don't need massive changes. We're not asking you to change anything. We're not asking for discounts. We understand that if we have a summer booking and a winter booking, it's basically going to be double. We understand all of that. And um, <coughs> it seemed like a bit of a win. That's not mentioned anywhere in this document. Um, in the document, it states that to date, the 2023 season, Ellenbrook United has only paid through to the city of Swan, or actually says zero dollars for the 2020, 2022-23 uh, season to date. Um, and in the pre-season was 6,500. Um, it says post-season, but we haven't had post-season yet, so I'm not sure how that works. Um, according to our records, we paid through $28,938 just in pitch bookings. Um, previous year, it states in the document that we paid 9700 and 6,002, uh, sorry, 9,700 for in-season and 6,225 for casual bookings. Uh, we paid 23,604. And just going back a little bit, pre-COVID, um, I think we were about $33,500. I can get that exact figure if we need to. So I'm a little bit confused on why it's this document's painting a picture that Elmbrook United is not putting... A decent amount of money in there. I can't even imagine what it would cost the city to run that facility. Um, I know this document does mention some city programs, um, and that's my next question is, what are those city programs? Because that city programs, which states the year current is $78,000. I don't understand, unless that includes Ellenbrook United, or I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about that because uh, as president, and I think I've got about 50 other jobs in the club, like other sporting people probably realise how it works when you're a volunteer. Um, I'm at the club every single day, um, much to my wife's disgust. But I don't see I, – I, I see some kids in there on a Wednesday and a Thursday morning. I see a couple of other things happening, some futsal, which we actually help run, help council run. But I don't see anything else. I'm just a little bit confused at how that's painted the picture that external programs are $78,000 and according to your document, Ellenbrook United – has uh, contributed zero dollars for this financial year today. So my request, I actually, I don't know how to request this, but um, in my opinion, this document needs to be revisited um, and I would request that it's reviewed before it goes to council next week. That's Thank it for me. You. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Richardson, you were first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I can ask through you to staff, I, I too am just interested in the figures. Uh, we can have, find you a, have you got sorry. a question for um, the president? Uh, no, it was to follow up. Okay, so we well, find I'll take questions while we're standing at the podium. We do right. questions to staff second. That question to you then, please, is the the cost that you actually quoted then that you that the um, Ellenbrook United has contributed um, that document that you've got it and your figures there. Where is it listed? It's got zero for... Um, on page three, it's your agenda item. Yep. Um, for So it's under 3.3, 3, um, motion 24. Okay. So it's, uh, this is the revenue for the 22-23. And had you had you um, given that information to the city swan at all? Um, no. No. No, okay. I presume this is something that's come up, whoever who has written this document. Okay. We'll see then. Okay. Councillor Bowman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mark, the casual bookings that you undertake, are there any times when you've had a casual booking and then it gets cancelled on you? 
Um, well, given that our casual bookings are through summer, yes. Um, so we, we operate under the Football West um, heat policy. So for children, if it's over 32 degrees and for adults, if it's over 34 and a half degrees, they can't train. Okay. So, um, the, yes, that's when they, we, we don't have a choice. We have to cancel them. And have there been bookings that you've made that even the City of Swan have cancelled? Um, City of Swan, as in City of Swan, have cancelled on from us. So, so you've had you've had bookings, you've booked them, thought you're going to have it, and then they've been cancelled. Yes, only when there's double bookings, which we haven't been advised about. Okay, um, when you make the bookings, oh, wait, sorry, to, we, we don't get advice. We have two teams turn up. <laughs> so, yeah, and that creates we've got we, pretty much when you <laughs> when you make the bookings in the pre post season bookings. How much work's involved in that from a club point of view? Um, from the volunteers' point of view, so this season that's fallen on my shoulders. So uh, I couldn't even put an hourly time on it. Um, it, it. It's a couple of hours a week. Okay. Um, but then it's a couple of hours a week chasing up if there's cancellations. So I think three years ago under the previous president, um, he didn't cancel um, any of the bookings. So and, – and to – sort of highlight on that as well we end up cancelling about half of our bookings because of heat heat alone yeah. um so yeah um in the report you may be able to ask this answer this one too it talks about various birthday parties hires and events i've since been told there's been three birthday parties this financial year of soccer parties has there ever been you've been at the soccer club for a while any 18th and 21st birthday parties held there um yes yeah there was a there's an 18th birthday there oh gee that would have been uh, probably just before christmas okay and how'd that go um was council not aware of that or <laughs> the police were called to do it so <laughs> um I, I don't know the full report because i asked for the report and i didn't get it uh, only because some of our trophies got damaged but um uh, council staff uh, they did say that they wouldn't be holding 18s or 21sts or those type of parties there again. Okay. Um, ever seen basketball played on the synthetic soccer pitch? Basketball? Yes. No, you can't. Okay. You can't play basketball. Oh, well, that's maybe in the car park. I, I, I asked. I asked the question because that's where part of the uh, city program revenue um, has come from. Um, do you think the synthetic soccer pitch has been underutilized at the moment? And what will a 12-month agreement do to change that? Um, it's being underutilised only in that Ellenbrook United spends a lot of time drawing other series of soccer in. So, hence, we hosted the uh, night series for MPL, which is basically the top league of football in um, in Western, well, in Australia. Um, so, we host all those. We don't even have teams in them, but we host them for Football West. For us, it puts money over our bar, but it also promotes Ellenbrook United Football Club with the pure intention of attracting more players to the club. Um, in turn, um, we don't hold, at the moment, we don't hold um, uh, school programs. Um, we'd, we'd like to start doing that. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot more scope to hold more events there, but I can't see what type of events they would be other than soccer. Okay. Thank you. Councillor McCulloch. Thank you, Mark. What kind of utilisation days and times, approximate hours, would you would you generally anticipate in the off season that you'd use? Um, I think probably the biggest thing is was we we need to define what we call an off season versus what the city calls an off season. So I understand where you've got a, a, an AFL oval and cricket, and I understand there has to be that crossover. And those two sports nationwide seem to work and their, their uh, seasons are based around the fact that they know there's going to be a pitch dug up or laid, depending on whether you um, AFL or, or cricket. Yeah. So our season is actually seven and a half months of pure games. So that doesn't include any pre-season training or anything like that. And when I say pre-season season training, you, you can't just turn up on the day that your booking start and start playing football. Any sport, you can't do it. Yeah. So really, our season is nine months. Mm -hmm. So um, in that nine months, even our juniors train and play for seven months. And that's from kids that are eight up. 
Our little techers, which are our three-year-olds through to seven-year-olds, they're all year round on, uh, on a Saturday morning and a Wednesday afternoon. Um, our current usage, basically, well, as of this week, for example, we are from five o'clock through till about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Um, uh, I'm not sure the council's aware, but we're actually down to three pitches at the moment. One, the pitches are going to be all repaired again, once again. So we've um, we've had to squeeze up some of our under eights and nines only get to train once a week because we don't have, we just, we cannot fit, physically fit them on the pitches. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in our off season, um, we be, you're a little bit more limited because you can't even get on the pitches until about six. So you can't train the youngsters. So MPL, which is the Australia top lead soccer, that starts from 13 all the way up. So, and we have very active 13 year olds. So they train, they have a month off. So our, our last games are in or middle of October and finals. Mm -hmm. Then they're in training in November for the following season. So that's, so they're straight into it. Um, and they train three nights a week. Okay. So that's just, that's those junior teams. Then there's the senior teams. Yeah. Um, and then you have all the night series and cups and things like that. Uh, with the Women's World Cup, it's promoting a lot more football as well around the whole of Australia um, and bringing a lot of girls into the sport. Mm. So that's huge. Yeah. Um, so we've doubled just this year, we've doubled our women's, girls and women's teams um, in numbers. So um, I think we're up 11 teams this year than what we were last year which has made it really hard because we've gone up in teams, but down, we've lost one pitch. So, um, yeah, it's, um, but we're work I mean, the city's been great with us working with getting the, the pitches repaired and yeah. it's just, it has to happen. So we're, we work with the city on that. So, yeah. Okay. Now that's great information. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. You have a further question, Councillor Bowman? Just following off that, you said you've got 11 new teams. What's your numbers like uh, for kids, seniors? Um, we'll, so, so last year, I think we were about 360. So this year we should be up about 450 pre COVID and pre, um, again, I'm not sure the council is aware, but three years ago when the pitches were completely closed and we were moved over to an external pitch somewhere else, we lost nearly, uh, we well, actually exactly. We lost 192 members because it was over this, it was actually just out of the back here. So a lot of people won't drive from Averley, Elmbrook, Bullsbrook to bring little Billy over to play soccer over here. So we actually lost a lot of numbers. So back then we had just over 600. So we're getting back up there. So uh, the Women's World Cup has made a massive difference. So the promotion of that is, is bringing a lot of numbers in. So, yeah, the girls, even our little, as I say, our little techers that we run, three through to seven-year-olds, you know, we would get, I, work, I think we're up to about 140 in there now on a Saturday morning, and about a quarter of them are, are girls now, which is great because two years ago there was three or four. So, yeah. Councillor mm. Carolina. Uh, thank you. Um, the issue seems to be that, uh, you know, you can't get the 12 months bookings because of other users. But what's your view on that? I mean, do you think that? Uh, you can kind of coexist with these other users, and have you already been doing that? Um, up to a point, there are no other users. So the users that have been identified are in here are schools that operate during the day. So Ellenbrook United don't operate when schools are doing it. So one of the schools was actually my boy who goes to the school. So I got to know the phys ed person <laughs> and said, "Well, where's the Catholic cup going to be? Let's do it at DOS. Here's the person to ring." So that's that's during school time. So we don't use the pitches during the day during school time. So um, there, as far as I'm aware, the users that have been listed in this report, none of them use them in the same time as us in in winter or summer booking. So it, there would be no clash <coughs> whatsoever. Um, as I said, I didn't know that basketball was ever played there. It can't be played there. But so that must be another venue we're referring to there. Um, but yeah, the, the colleges, the uh, Catholic college, um, birth, birthday parties, we always work in with one of the staff always ring us and say, is this, are you using the club rooms on this date? Um, and if we're not great, have a birthday party. Again, for us, if it's an external person bringing non-soccer people in, the kids might like it and then come and join our club. So 
it's a, it's a win-win. As long as it's not an 18th. So <laughs> no conflict of use that you're aware of? No. Up to now? No. I mean, no. there's a number of sports okay. in my understanding that have tried using the facility, um, um, but it's not the type of grass that it is, the fact that it has a camber on the pitch for drainage, the fact that during summer, as I say, you, you can't even walk on the pitch. Um, it literally, and I'm not exaggerating here, it literally melts a boot in summer. So, um, and I've got a picture of that imagine. if everyone wants to. So, um, yeah, so it's, there is, it, it's a purpose-built facility for this sport. Um, and I, if other sports want, if they're in, I've never seen Frisbee there, but if they want to jump in, great. We'll work with any sport and, and work around that. When we're one pitch down, that makes it super hard at this time of year because we're re I mean, we've got on a Wednesday or so tonight, on one pitch, there's eight teams training. <clears throat> so we're really crammed everybody in there. And two of those teams don't even get to train on another night at the moment. So <laughs> we try and offer two nights a week training, which every sport tries to do. But every sport's in the same situation. We, I get it. We're all confined by these beautiful premises that council supplies us but we want to utilise it more. We want to utilise more. Um, I suppose we just want our hands untied a little bit um, and, yeah, promote the City of Swan more out there. So, as I, I mean, as I say, when we hold night series there, we hold four, we held 44 games of which nobody from Millenbrook United participated in. So all of those teams bringing in 18 players plus 50 people each into the city, some as far as Bunbury, Geraldton, Mandra, um, and of course all your Wanneroos and everywhere else, we're all coming up and uh, and tr and everybody just remarks at how gorgeous that facility is. So, but unfortunately it doesn't look like a club at the moment, so it's Thank getting there. Um, are there any other questions for um, Mark? And I thank you for your time, for your deputation and answering questions. You so, have a question for staff, Councillor Bowman. May I ask just one more thing? So, how? Uh, excuse my ignorance here, but the fact that I've addressed some things that aren't correct in there, what's the process from there? I'm sure uh, some of your local councillors will be speaking to you before okay. next Wednesday. All right, night. perfect. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bowman, you've got a question of staff. Yes, I have, Mr Mayor. Um, first question is, We've heard about the figures. Are they incorrect? Mr Bishop? Um, through you, Mr Mayor, I'm assuming uh, Council is referring to the financial figures in the report. Yes. Um, I'm, look, as far as I'm concerned, the figures are correct. Um, I think what uh, the deputation was referring to is the fact there's no figure stated for revenue from the club for this year. There's no inference in that that there isn't revenue from the club refers in the report the fact that there hasn't been invoiced yet for the winter season. Um, happy to take that on notice and confirm if there has been revenue since since that's been put in the report. So probably continue from that. Um, quick calculations, 15,925, this report saying from last year we heard from the deputation 23,604, um, has also said for this year 28,900 and the report saying 653. Uh, second question, the city programs. Uh, 61,100 revenue and 78,484. Am I correct that they're not soccer programs, but they're programs that are held at other locations as well, including basketball, which is at Savax, and not at this facility? Mr Bishop? Um, I certainly have, I can certainly talk to the total figures, but if the question is related to a breakdown of activities at different locations, um, we do have actually here, Mr. Mayor, with your consent, the manager leisure services. So it might be prudent just to check with him in regards to figures. Do they relate only to programs at this facility or programs at this facility and elsewhere, which I think is the intent of Councillor Bowden's question. Uh, I'm happy for any staff to answer a question. Uh, if you know the answer, Jared, or you need to take it on notice, that's up to you. So if you can assist Councillor Bowden, please do so. Um, yeah, my understanding is it does include programs um, that are run by staff who are based at the facility, includes including soccer programs on the pitches and other programs held also. So through you, Mr Mayor, to the Acting CEO, 
Would you agree this report's misleading in, in that information there? Mr Bishop? Um, it would be misleading if the financials relate to um, a significant proportion of programs run on different locations. Uh, the, figures, the figures we have is obviously around activity at this location, which is, which I can quote figures if Council so wishes to know how many participants are participating in programs. But I suggest what we do, Mr Mayor, is just take it on notice and confirm is the financials purely related to activity on this location or a mixture of locations? I think that's the question that's been asked. Mr Mayor, just want to uh, check in the report, it says various birthday party hires from events. I've got a response to that question today where I've been told this financial year so far, there's only been three kids' soccer parties. Is that correct? There's only been three parties, not various birthday parties? Mr Bishop? Yes, if that's the answer that's been provided, that, that, that is the correct answer. Mr Mayor, through you to the Acting CEO, my understanding is there's one full-time staff member being the Leisure Program Corps based at this facility, whose main role is to coordinate bookings and programs. Is that correct? Mr Bishop? That is correct, yes. Mr Mayor, through you to the Acting CEO, I've been advised that this position, uh, half of their time is taken up with bookings and it's been advised to the club president that if it wasn't the off-season bookings, that this position would not have a lot to do because half their role would go. Is that correct? Mr Bishop? Sorry, Mr Mayor, could I ask that question to be asked again? So my understanding is this role, this person or position is bookings and programs, and the club president has been advised that half of that role is bookings, and as such, if there was a 12-month period instead of the casual bookings, that half the role of this position would be not needed because there would be no task to do. Is that correct? Was he advised that? Um, through you, Mr Mayor, I, I would have to take on notice what, what percentage applies. But the position is a 12-month position. Um, that, pro, that officer runs a number of programs. That includes toddler programming for 480 total admissions for term one this year, junior sports programming for 3,510 total admissions for term one of this year, and adult sports programming for 165 admissions per week from March of this year onwards. So those programs run 12 months of the year. Okay. My next question is we heard from the deputation about most of those other users that they were brought to the facility because of the club. Is that correct? Mr Bishop? I'd have to take that on notice. I don't know the answer to that question, Mr Mayor. Mr Mayor, will the Acting CEO recommend this item be pulled so we get provided better information so we can make a fully informed decision? Mr Bishop? Um, through you, Mr Mayor, not at this point in time. We'll certainly, the questions we've taken on notice, we will review believe that that has substantially changed the report, then obviously that would be an option. Thank you. Councillor Catalano, questions of staff? Yes, thank you. Um, could we have a breakdown? You, you mentioned Topler. I'm not sure what you mean by Topler, but maybe that's an acronym for something. Um, adult sports and junior sports, and um, that there's been this number of them. What percentage or what, how, how many of those bookings are actually the um, football club itself and how many of them are other users? Because, uh, you know, we're getting this contradictory uh, uh, view or this contradictory account of what's actually going on at this um, grounds and um, we need to get to the bottom of, uh, you know, who's actually using it, when they're using it and um, is it actually all these numbers of users actually the uh, football club itself using it. So would you mind providing us with a breakdown of that uh, over the week? So, Bishop, through you, Mr Mayor, absolutely. I, I think the crux of the question is, is there's no doubt that the club are a very significant and important user of the facility. The city and other users also seek to use that facility when the club is not using it, which is particularly during, obviously, the off-season. And the figures I've quoted is, is in regards to some of the programs the city runs with significant participation. However, as per the deputation, it comes down to is there a conflict of use then? 
if if the soccer club is primarily training in the evenings and weekends and other activities are during the day like school maybe there isn't if however the other activities that are run by the city and other users of the facility do overlap with the casual use during the summer month then there may be conflict of use so i think some assessment of whether there is the timings i think is what you're suggesting yes i agree we should drill down on that to work out you know what can be achieved in terms of extending their their booking season thank you councillor bowman mr mayor mr mayor through you the acting ceo said there's other users seeking to use it am i correct that the only other users that we're aware of are the ones that are listed in the report or are there people that have been denied previously mr bishop Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, I would have to take on notice whether there's been other users who have sought to use it and have been denied. Uh, certainly, as per the deputation mentioned, we have had other clubs and potential users approach us to get access to that facility. And Mr. Mayor, the acting CEO, through you to the acting CEO, his response to the last question said that there was uh, programs with significant numbers. Uh, just want to double check. These are significant numbers that aren't all held at this venue is that correct mr bishop uh, that was the question we would take on notice to double check whether they were figures purely for use at this facility or whether they included figures for any other facility in the precinct i'll ask are there any other questions being no further questions uh we'll be moving shortly on to item 4.1 but i've had a uh, late uh, disclosure of interest and it's on item 4.1 by councillor richardson it's an impartiality um interest and the item is the consideration of submissions proposed amendment to 211 local planning scheme number 17 to rezone john septimus row anglican school from private clubs and institutions to residential development at a certain locations in the Black Boy Way, Beachborough. Um, and the interest is that uh, Councillor Richardson had uh, her children attend another school some years ago when Mr Bartell was principal, and Mr Bartell will be giving the deputation tonight on behalf of JSR. So I'll hand that um, interest in. And that takes us to item 4.1. It's on page 106 of your agenda and call Mr. Jason Bartell, Principal of John Septimus Row Anglican School, uh, and you'll have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Bartell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to commend and take this opportunity to commend the city's officers for their report. Uh, but there's been a high level of due diligence applied and also thank them for their positive uh, consideration and recommendation. The Anglican Schools Commission note the matters made in submissions and concur with the city's officers that these will all be addressed in the structure planning process. Of particular note in the report that is in front of you is that none of the 10 agency submissions objected uh, to this site's rezoning. So as not to take any more of the council's uh, time, I'd be happy to answer any questions that councillors may have. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Catalano first. Um, we've had um, a significant number of people in the area uh, very concerned about the removal of the large Mary trees on the site, on the school site, and um, uh, wondering um, if uh, you would uh, support an amendment to the motion for those Mary trees to be retained as part of the um, rezoning. Um, as, as the report has stated, um, that needs to be uh, detailed in the structure planning process. Um, so at this point in time, I would be suggesting amendment to the report. Um, we need to consider, have due consideration with respect to the structure planning process further. Councillor Bowman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Adding on from Councillor Catalano, because I've asked something similar, um, and the advice I got from staff was, uh, we could make a resolution expressing a requirement for trees to be retained in future developments. Would you be okay with that? Would be okay to the consideration of such in the actual structural planning process. Absolutely. Thank you. Any further questions, councillors? 
There are no further questions. I thank you for your attendance, giving your deputation and answering questions. Uh, that takes us to the next item on the agenda, councillors. Item 4.2 is on page 145 of your agenda. It's amendment to uh, one to structure plan 34 North Stoneville town site. I have two in person's deputation. The first one is uh, Mr. Dwayne Scook. Thank you. We'll have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and councillors. I'm a City of Swan resident and the chair of Susanna Brook Catchment Group. I live adjacent to North Stoneville site, literally over the road, and support the City Officer's recommendation to oppose SP 34. Firstly, I want to acknowledge the members of the community who are knowledgeable, experienced and well qualified in these areas who have provided advice as to the poor reports the proponent has provided, which are misleading and missing critical detail. The community safety will be directly threatened following review of the bushfire management plan presented. The key points being the modelling does not cover worst case scenario, for example, fire danger, <coughs> wind direction. Secondly, the data used is not suitable as it is modelled on data from Bickley, which is not only a different fire with a district, uh, the site, the structure plan site being Swan Inland North and Bickley is Swan Inland South. Anyone who tracks the daily fire risk levels would know we're often rated at a higher risk than South on any given day. The data they used uses low attempts, higher rainfall and only 23 years of data when the 50 year historical records are required. <coughs> The road upgrades fail to acknowledge any works required at the intersections of Hawkstone and Rowland and Woolhouse and Stoneville roads, both of which are in Swan and extremely dangerous due to blind hills, as well as one being a non-aligned intersection. They fail to adequately include these in their modelling, and this is putting my family and neighbours at risk. We could never enter the gazetted main exits in the chaos of a fire. Would Swan have to pay for those intersections too? With regards to stormwater, wastewater treatment plant, related storage and subsequent reticulation, some key points are, it is claimed there's no buffer zone is required. <coughs> However, there must be at some point an assessment of the plant and storage. The city of Swan should be taking a proactive role in this as the plant is on the Swan side of the hill with Swan residents living next to it, dealing with the odour and aerosol dispersion from the storage. Can I request that the city please check this is correct as it does not seem to be the case with reference to the EPA guidance for assessment of environmental factors. The release treated sewerage will contain not only nutrients, but unmitigated substances, including pharmaceuticals and PFAS chemicals, which are found in many products. The impermeable soils will ensure the majority will traverse across the surface and into the tributaries into Susanna Brook. The stormwater management is insufficient and at best we'll have dams holding the concoctions until it either overflows, leaks, or runs off around the dams. They have no plan to remove the contaminated water. The stormwater drains are only designed to capture a 15 millimetre rain event. So where does the rest go? Many of us in Swan surrounding the site have bores and or spring fed dams, despite the proponent claiming there is no groundwater or recharge. This development will co contaminate our secondary water supplies, tributaries, the Susanna Lakes, which were constructed in the city of Swan as a water supply to surrounding properties and still in operation. In summary, further to the city officer's recommendation, the city of Swan community directly impacted by this proposal respectfully ask the council extend the resolution to include the items from the original motion from the city's strategic community plan, items N1.1, N2.2 and S1.1, as they will directly impact the health, well-being, and safety of residents and fail to protect our natural resources and fail to protect local ecology and biodiversity of natural ecosystems. This is based upon the inadequate bushfire management plan, the highly likely mismanaged pollutants from the site from both wastewater irrigation and any holding dam leaks, release or overflow and stormwater runoff, which will come immediately downhill into the city of Swan. You have one minute left, thank you. This plan is in perpetuity. There is no stopping once it started and there's no switching off. The proponent has provided insufficient detail to mitigate any of these concerns. Further to this, given the critical point at which this is at, I also request council strongly consider requesting WAPC engage the EPA to carry out a formal assessment of the structure plan, given the high risk for poor outcomes in Swan. Advice from the Office of the Minister 
for the environment has confirmed this is possible. Thanking you for your time to consider. Thank you. Any questions, councillors? Councillor Bowman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you for taking me for a tour uh, of the affected area a few weeks ago. Um, just making sure I got the right roads. Hawkstone and uh, Woolhouse, is it? The two that don't connect? Correct. Um, can you just explain to us what's in between the middle of those two roads, how far? Um, the proponent's report says it's 200 metres. Um, it's definitely more than 100. And it's, it's uh, well, I'd call it reasonably dense bush. Um, the way the proponent's report states is that they're just going to put a road through, which um, obviously it's not quite that simple. Uh, and also there's a heritage site adjacent to that on the on in Parkerville, on, called Parkerville 1, which is on their side of the border. However, when you look at the heritage reports, that site extends into Swan as well. The original document um, in 1998 regarding the S18, the response from the minister at the time said that there had to be a 30 metre buffer and also there could be no pollutants entering the tributaries. Um, also, that's the that's the road you access to get onto Roland, is it? Uh, Hawk, Hawkstone <laughs> enters onto Roland yep. to the west and Woolhouse enters onto Stoneville uh, to the east and that's misaligned with Cameron Road. So it's a misaligned intersection which would need changing anyway. And what, what's the conditions of those intersections from a safety point of view in your, in your opinion as a local user? Uh, they're quite dangerous because both of them are actually got blind hills when you're actually uh, leaving um, our residents onto either Stoneville or Roland. I think it's pretty lucky we don't have many accidents then. I think it's just the lack of the, the low relative population we have that's saving at the moment. And last question through you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, you indicated you're the chair of Susanna Brook. Yes. Um, is there, with that, that road to be built, is that going through anything that then flows into the Susanna Brook that you're aware of? Uh, yes, the well, both of them, both tributaries, there's two, uh, Willow Brook, which is to the west, and there's the one to the east, and both flow down into the Susanna Brook directly. The one to the east, that flows directly into the lower Susanna Lake. Any other questions, councillors? Being no other questions, I thank you for your time, giving your deputation, answering questions. And the next speaker on the same item is Mr Paul Matthews. Thank you, Paul. You'll also have five minutes. I'd like to thank the Mayor and the councillors for the opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Paul Matthews and reside at 29 Waterford Drive, Kitchikana. My property is located less than 250 metres from the northern boundary of the proposed development site. I support the officer's report and recommendations for the city not to support the proponents amended North Stoneville Townsite SP34 application and thank them for their time taken reviewing the various applicant documents. I'd like to talk to the proposed construction of the missing portion, approximately 250 metres of road, renamed Hawkstone Street and Woolhouse Lane, formerly fragmented parts of Cameron Road, as I believe this will further assist the city with their opposition to SP34. My street connects to the western end of Woolhouse Lane. The connection of these roads will transform them from local access road to suburb connector roads that bisect the existing wetlands. The assessment of this is missing from the traffic impact assessment. I'm very concerned pollutants, environmental, Aboriginal heritage and traffic consultants have failed to access, <coughs> assess the impact of this proposal, particularly as the land and the wet wetland habitat located within the submain section of road is likely to be of the same Aboriginal heritage significance and provides a direct and continuous connection of habitat with the land located to the north of the development site. The proponent's assessment stops at the southern side of Hawkstone Street. Can the city please confirm that the location of this boundary relative to the northern boundary of the development site? This piece of wetland supports Calatherbuck Creek, which is a tributary to the Susanna Lakes, and provides direct and indirect seasonal water flow to at least nine private dams along its path. Native vegetation, including many large grass trees with an estimated age at least 150 years, and it provides a connection between the north and the south for movement of wildlife. <coughs> I also refer to the existing dam located in the northeastern corner of the proposed development site, which contributes water inflow to these wetlands through Cutterbuck Cleek. 
given the proponent's proposal to use recycled water for reticulation purposes, I'm concerned that the dam will become a receptor for contaminated water. It has been scientifically proven that the filter membr membranes of recycled water treatment facilities are unable to remove small particulate matter, including pharmaceuticals. It's well documented that up to 90% of medications we take uh, is expelled intact with urine. This includes antibiotics, analgesics, contraceptive estrogens, uh, antidepressants, beta blockers, etc. Research conducted in Australia has found that 69 different drugs in more than 190 invertebrates. Same concern applies to other contaminants, such as surface applied fertilizers, phosphates, contaminants from vehicles, which also enter the same water course. As the proponents, stormwater management design relies on surface drainage, these particulates will collect and concentrate within the dam, then be flushed into the wetlands to the north during winter. This would be catastrophic for the water courses and the flora and fauna within these wetlands. Clutterbuck Creek flows through the bottom of my property, Hence, its preservation is highly important to me. These same concerns apply to the existing dam, located the west of this dam, which is located 350 metres downhill from the proposed water treatment site. The proponent's stormwater drainage scheme shows surface drainage from the wastewater treatment plant to this dam. The location of these dams mean that their contamination is of little consequence to the proposed <coughs> development, but of major consequence to the land to its north. The proponent's Aboriginal Heritage Report includes a copy of a letter from the Minister for Housing, Aboriginal Affairs, Water Resources to the Perth Dyson Trustees, which makes them aware that the land contains sites of Aboriginal heritage um, and tributaries of Jane and Susanna Brooks within the development area preserved as much as possible in public open space and a 30 metre buffer zone be established from the banks of the watercourses. Sorry, I'm running out of breath, but I'm trying to get through this quickly. You have one minute left, thank you. Adequate strategies be implemented to ensure no pollutants enter the brook. The proponents further provide further information to detail the impact of the proposed development on the watercourses. Uh, I'm just going to skip through to an important point. Um, state government has published a new native vegetation policy, May 2022, which provides a framework for achieving good outcomes in the management of vegetation and recognise the need to preserve its internationally renowned biodiversity, Aboriginal heritage and STEM client, effects of climate change. Um, Given that, I'd ask that the city uh, consider the importance of these issues and refer them to the EPA for further consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. <laughs> Councillor Bohm, you have a question? Thank you. My apologies, Paul. Probably should have asked you some of those questions that I asked Twain. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, Aboriginal significant site. Yeah. Um, is there one or is there more that you're aware of? There's multiple, multiple have been recognised within the actual area that's been surveyed by the developer. But to the north of that, well, the letter that came from the minister at that time has indicated that whole strip as it being of Aboriginal heritage significance. Okay. And um, obviously I didn't see much scheme water when I was out there no. a couple of weeks ago. Where do you get your drinking water from? I collect it from the roof. Okay. And things like for your veggie garden and all that? From my dad. That's the reason why you're concerned. Thank yep. you. And we feed animals from that dam as well. Yep. Any other questions, councillors? <coughs> Once again, Paul, I thank you for your attendance, your deputation, answering questions. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to the next item, councillors, item 4.3, the Responsible Authority Report proposed a road house on Neves Road, Bullsbrook. It's on page 166 of your agenda. And the first in-person deputation is uh, Ms Margaret Carlton in support of the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Margaret. Once you start speaking, you'll have five minutes. Good evening, everyone. I'm in support of the officer's recommendation, thank you. And I oppose the proposal for the roadhouse at Lot 31, Needs Road, Bullsbrook. I live at 1506 Needs Road, Bullsbrook, which is directly opposite the site where they propose to put the roadhouse. Um, our house is approximately 30 metres back from the road which is not very far. And we only have one row of immature trees along the road front. So we'll be directly impacted negatively by this proposal. I'll just put in dot points some of the things that we are concerned about. Um, the aesthetics, because according to the plans in the Responsible Authority report, this site will be elevated and there will be very little, if any, vegetation on, along the road front to provide any cover of the buildings 
from our view, from our house, or to protect us from the lights, the noise, the odour, or the pollution that may come from it if it's um, put forward. Uh, lighting and noise is another big issue. Where we live now, it's very dark at night. There's no street lighting and it's very quiet. While Neves Road is a busy road during the day, especially <coughs> during weekdays, it is quiet at night. Any cars that do go past, pass through. They have no influence on us at all. Lights from this proposed roadhouse, particularly as the site will be elevated, will shine directly into our house. Um, Cars that will be stopping, trucks that will be stopping because it's a 24-hour roadhouse will be making a lot of noise while they stop as they take off again and their lights as they leave will again be directly into our house. There will be other noises as well from voices and music both from vehicles stopping and from the roadhouse. Our other concerns are for antisocial behaviour. I'm a police officer, I've worked in this area, and I'm well aware of the antisocial behaviour that is attracted to 24-hour roadhouses. The reason we live in a rural area is to be away from that sort of behaviour and to have the quiet and peace. We're also concerned about odours and pollution from fuel and from fast food. Fire risk is another big problem. This area is a declared bushfire zone and this proposal will increase that already high risk. And I see in the report that the Department of Fire and Emergency Services have great concerns. Water is another issue. We do not have access to scheme water and all the local residents rely on the groundwater supplies. Fuel outlets present a threat to underground water quality and can compromise the groundwater supplies both through contamination from fuel and sewerage as well as overuse of the water. This proposal could detrimentally impact the water supply for all the local residents and also for the surrounding bushland and wildlife. We have some very beautiful Swan Coastal Plain Bankshire woodlands in our area on our block and also on the block where the site is proposed. Um, another concern is the expansion of Neves Road. Uh, main roads have plans in the future to widen Neves Road from a two lane to a four lane road the current plan runs through the front of the proposed site and this has not been considered in the proposal. If the proposal was to go ahead and the roadhouse was built, we have grave concerns that that will then impact us directly. We have a long, narrow block that goes for about a kilometre along Neves Road but is only about 60 metres deep. So if they were requiring our block to create the four lanes, they'll bulldoze our house. They may be reluctant to put a bulldozer to the roadhouse if it's already there. And our other concern is then they might push the site further north on the block into the protected Bankshire woodlands. You have one minute left, thank you. Okay, thank you. So to finish, the objectives of the general rural zoning that we have includes ensuring the use and development of land within the zone does not prejudice the rural amenity and promotes the enhancement of the rural character. This proposal does not fit with this objective and should this proposal go ahead, this non-rural use would negatively impact on us and other residents on our land and on our rural activities. We would also lose our lifestyle, our privacy and our peace and we would be at risk of financial hardship with probable loss of value of our property. And all of this while the owner of the property does not live locally and all while there are already multiple roadhouses, truck stops, service stations existing and proposed in Bullsbrook and the surrounding areas of Newshay, Upper Swan and Wanneroo, including two proposals already on Neves Road, one approximately two kilometres to the west of this proposed site and the other approximately four kilometres to the east, both already approved by JDAP. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for your great timing. Councillors, are there any questions? Councillor Bowman. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Margaret, just a quick question. How long have you lived in that area for? Um, just we, roughly. We built the house in 2005. Okay, so you know the area quite well. Yes. Um, can you tell me of any other buildings in the rural area of that attended scale that you're aware of within a kilometre? No. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, councillors? Then I thank you for your attendance and your deputation and questions answered. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker on the same item is Ross Underwood from uh, Planning Solutions, not in support of the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Ross. You'll also be given five minutes from when you start speaking.
Thank you very much. Um, now, planning solutions is the applicant for this proposal. We're acting for the landowner uh, who's had this property for about 17 years. He's identified the need, the unmet need to service B double and vehicles traveling along this portion of the road. Um, in doing so, the first step we took was to meet with the city's officers approximately 16 months ago. And at that time, uh, we were advised that there weren't any fatal flaws. From that point, we engaged the consultant team to commence the design and technical reporting for this proposal. Uh, those same officers are now recommending refusal to this development. In regard to the three reasons, firstly, with respect to the rural character of this development in its locality, uh, the point we make is that a roadhouse, and, and this is typical for all roadhouses, are built to service the passing vehicle traffic. They are, by necessity and design, located close to the road in which they serve. Uh, there's nothing unusual about a roadhouse in a rural area being located close to the road so that there's convenient access to and from the road and visibility to the facility. There was comments made about the colour scheme of the development in that regard where uh, we agreed to receive a condition that would require uh, a colour scheme to be prepared uh, more in keeping with the rural character of the locality. There were a number of comments that related to the design of the development consistent with SPP 7, which relates to good design. Uh, we're confident that what we're proposing is above average in terms of its uh, features for a service station, roadhouse and truck stop of this type of facility. And I say that uh, with the company I'm employed at Planning Solutions having worked for over 20 years on, on a range of different service station and fuel uh, facilities, numbering uh, from last count, which was a few years back, over 400. What what we're proposing is a roadhouse that provides for a range of facilities that are above and beyond those that are found in, in the area of a similar type. The city's design review panel, um, and, and this I would say is to their credit, uh, would like us to do something else. So they would like us to pro pro provide something that would be a real uh, drawing card for visitors and tourists along the road. Uh, they would also like it, us to provide an architectural masterpiece, I think it's fair to say. Uh, in that regard, what we propose is a functional and entirely appropriate design for the roadhouse, and we consider that on its merits, it warrants approval. I want to comment finally on the bushfire matter that's raised as a reason for refusal. The comment relates purely to the location of the water tank for the facility, which is on the edge of the site. And it's a very easily resolved matter. It would require simply uh, pushing the edge of the clearing a few metres back so that the water tanks fall outside uh, the bow 40 zone. It's something that only came to our light when the agenda was published. Uh, so we haven't yet had a chance to respond formally to that. It's a fairly minor Thing, and it could be dealt with as a condition of approval. So in saying that, we would like this facility to meet the unmet demand for this type of facility along Meves Road. And I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, councillors? Councillor Catalano first. Oh, thank you. Um, can you tell me who owns the land surrounding the site with the petrol station? You want to put the petrol station? Do you know who owns all that bushland? Uh, the bushland on our site, which is the 44 hectare property and includes all of that bushland, uh, oh. is is our client, Justin Quinn. Sheffield. Oh, that, so they own the whole of that site? Yes. Oh, okay. So we've, we've located this to avoid the bushland. Okay. Uh, what, what kind of uh, plans are there for this site in the future? Uh, the, there's no plans other than what we're proposing today, which is the roadhouse. Oh, okay. So uh, can you tell me what you know of um, in terms of, um, you know, uh, state government planning decisions for that particular part of uh, Bullsbrook? It's identified in strategic planning initiatives for a, a rural area, so no change. For it to stay rural? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bowman, you're next. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, you mentioned you've done quite a few developments. I think you said 400. How many of those have been on other roadhouses in rural areas? I don't have an exact number. I can get back to you if you like. 
Uh, so, we've, so you've done a few? We've, we've provided over the last two decades uh, for a range of different fuel providers across the state and interstate. Okay. So it includes the re regional areas. Um, why does the scale need to be so big? Uh, it's, it's a scale which is appropriate to the facility, which is to provide for parking for the B-doubles. Uh, and in fact, I would say that um, it's, it's about the right scale. We were asked by the DRP if, if we could uh, yeah, expand the scope of it and include things. Yeah, so someone raised a comment that, that perhaps it could be a farmer's market or, or something like that. So um, we're confident that what we propose is the right size for the facility. Okay. And three, Mr. Mayor, last question. I'll ask the same, a similar question as asked the previous deputation. Um, within the area, can you name anything else that's got the same intended scale? Uh, as what you're proposing in this application? Uh, other than the two roadhouses that were mentioned by the previous... Uh, well, Outback Splash is the only other thing that comes to mind. Okay, thank you. Councillor Richardson. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, just uh, curious, uh, if you could just let me know um, what, if any, considerations were made or given to the nearest neighbours to sort of attempt to address, you know, the possible um, intrusion on the rural lifestyle? Um, that they have on their property, uh, addressing those issues that were um, pointed out earlier. Yeah, and it's a fair question. There were uh, a, a range of investigations into things such as light. There was a light study that was prepared for the application. Uh, there was an environmental report that, which dealt with things including odour. There, there was a noise impact assessment prepared. And based on the officer's own assessment, uh, they were satisfied of the level of detail included with those studies. Okay. And also, um, just, just out of curiosity, it does list in here 16 truck parking bays. So that is that for the B double size or is that a mixture accommodation or is that maximising it at 16 B doubles? 16 B doubles, yes. Okay. Where is the 16 truck parking bays uh, predominantly located in relation to the um, direct neighbour? They're to the rear, so they're, they're behind the okay. retail building. And uh, what I was going to ask was, um, the neighbours have expressed that there is no vegetational sort of screening or anything around um, this proposal. Is there any way of incorporating more screening if it was...? Yes. The simple answer is yes. We. Uh, we would commit to a landscape plan that would go into detail of, of the location and types of vegetation that could be planted. Right, thank you. Any other questions, councillors? Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for your attendance and uh, making your deputation, answering those questions. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Catalani, you want to ask staff questions now, please? Uh, Yes, okay. I'd like to ask um, Mr. Russell about the planning um, in the area. So um, it was mentioned that Neves Road is going to be turned into a major road. Can you uh, give us some, um, you know, reasons why they're going to do that? If they are in fact going to do that. Uh, three, Mr. Mayor. It's the question as to what is the rationale for upgrading needs road is that the question well if they are going to is that correct that there is going to be an upgrade of neves road firstly and yeah. why yes yes mr mayor there is uh intentions uh, that are probably fairly i don't know how far along advanced but to upgrade neves road to a road, I'm not too sure whether it's another regional road status, so either what the road level priority below primary regional road. The I suppose the obvious question is the extension of Neves Road through to the northern portions of the city of Wanneroo, which under the state planning framework is earmarked for substantial uh, future urban development. So it's obviously a east west in effect. <coughs> Yes, thanks. So um, the that that area, um, which, which part of of I might I mean I'm, I understand that there's going to be a big um, transport freight 
uh, facility up there. So how far away is that from uh, this particular uh, part of Neves Road? Because I, I, I kind of get the impression, I've had the impression that there's going to be an industrial area uh, located fairly close to Neves Road. Stand up, Mr. Mr. Mitchell. Mitchell. Probably might make it a bit easier. Um, yes, Council, you would be well aware that um, the South Ballsbrook industrial area is our big new industrial area that's been planned for over 10 years. And as we were know, we're in the process of completing the connection of Stock Road through to the Tonkin Highway extension. Now, my colleague, Mr. Van der Lind, is giving me some precise information, Scarling, that's about six kilometres uh, from the northern portion of the industrial area to uh, where Neves Road uh, comes out. Um, okay, and the, the um, I guess that's the, the northern um, side of Neves Road that we're talking about in terms of this particular location of this uh, site, right? So is that northern side of Neves Road going to be uh, retained as uh, um, rural, general rural, uh, in the future, or what's going on there? Through Mr Mayor, as the famous saying goes, there are a few things certain in life other than death and taxes. And um, it has been my observation over a decade that land that strategic documents depict as rural can, with the right degree of persuasion and technical investigation, be advanced in planning strategies to be for some other purpose. And as you will know, the, uh, the emergence of North Allenbrook as investigations area, both for residential and uh, industrial, he said 10 years ago was at the offing, the documents wouldn't have indicated that. So it is very dangerous and fruitless to speculate too far in advance in this climate, in this planning framework as to whether land such as the land north of Neves Road will be rural forever and a day, a lifetime or a decade. Suffice to say, that there is nothing, as the proponent has said, there's nothing in the extant planning documents to date that depict this being anything else other than what it is as we're all in. Councillor Richardson. I thank you, Mr. Mayor. A question through you to um oops, to Sarah. Turn right. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Russell. Um the just carrying on from that, that was part of my question was regarding Stock Road and what possible um development or discussions or planning. Uh, might have already been in play in terms of um, other fueling facilities that might be um, planned for that particular section that could cover that gap between there and Newshay, especially if there's heavy vehicles and, and the um, heavy industrial area out there. Is it likely that fueling stations will, that will be an ideal position out there for, uh, for another fueling station? For Mr Mayor, um The sorts of factors that impel parties to make commercial decisions, whether they have a contracted interested party to put a fuel station or they think the arrangements of access or the disposition of land relative to the transport network and other land uses might render something suitable for a fuel station is purely a decision made by them. What we can say is that in this area, as the council would be aware, the extension of the Tonkin Highway northwards to Mushay, the planned, such as they are, arrangements for future industrial and residential uses and upgrades of the road network make very strong indicators to people with land to think, well, hang on, there may be a demand <coughs> for uh, a roadhouse or a fuel station to service both residential passing traffic, commuter traffic and industrial traffic. <coughs> and certainly if Neves Road is going to uh, connect through to Wanneroo, uh, someone only needs to look at maybe the estimated figures to think this might be a good location. Um, I think the important thing for us to remember in planning, and I've had cause to, to mention this in the last couple of weeks, when we consider planning applications, do not fall into the erroneous trap of thinking there might be a better site. Okay? 
we assess the application on its merits. So whether it might be possible for a fuel station to go somewhere on Stock Road or anywhere else on any of the roads that come off uh, the Tonkin Highway extension is not relevant to our concerns here. Any other questions, councillors? Then we'll move to the next item on the agenda. And just uh, please note, there's also two written deputations on that item, one from uh, Anthony Lindsay and one from Linda Blinman. Um, the next item is item 4.5. It's on page 243 of your agenda. It's the proposed dining hall addition, Marshall Road, Bennett Springs. And I have an in-person uh, deputation from Mr Naresh Patel. Thank you, Naresh. You'll have five minutes, as have the other speakers. Good evening, Mr Mayor, councillors and city staff. Thank you for this opportunity to deputise this evening. Um, the temp, I'm generally in support of the, admit, of the recommendation by the city planning office. Uh, however, I'd like to make a few points that might be important. Uh, the location of the proposed dining hall in addition, uh, a lot of consideration has gone into this. Um, the site is impacted by site constraints, basically the Western Power easement, which tra traverses the majority of the site. On the east side, we've got the Venice Brook, and to the south, we've got the Emu Swamp Drain, which restricts development on the site. So we're trying to utilise as much as we possibly can for our congregation. For religious reasons, um, the dining hall needs to be located behind the temple. Uh, that, that is a religious and cultural issue. So <coughs> with the site specifics, we are really, really restricted. There's nowhere else we can go. And, and hence, we've been working on this site to try to develop something at the back there. For the last 10, 10 years, um, the congregation have had no dining facilities. They've, they've been having to sit outside on, on the road to tarmac in the shed which is really not appropriate, especially for the elderly and the children, especially in the um, different seasons in the heat climate and uh, during the winter season when it's wet and cold. Uh, the other issue is obviously this, this area for the elderly and the children as well. We have located the proposed dining hall as far away from the embankment or the creek as, as possibly we could. We've We've, we've been listening to the uh, the comments from the agencies, so we've, we've we've moved it back as much as we possibly could without having any impact uh, in regards to um, more substantial modifications to the existing temple building. Having regard to the existing underground services located behind the temple building, and the apparatus required for national construction code, so we've got to look at the fire jump. If it, if it gets any closer between the two, which is a concern. <coughs> it is important to note that the uh, proposed dining hall addition will be located in a portion of the land that is currently occupied by a large shed, a hard stand area, and so wells. <coughs> this is previously uh, approved by the city of, by the city in that extent. It represents redevelopment on existing development approved land. In formulating the proposal, proposal we also considered the Department of Water and Environment, DIVA, Operational Policy 4.3, identifying this and establishing waterways, foreshore areas. This is the policy that is commonly understood as establishing a 30 meter development setback to waterways. However, the under, understanding is not quite accurate. Enhancing the 30 meter, in, regarding the 30 meter setback, section 3.33 of the aforementioned DIVA operational policy states, in special circumstances, exceptions to the requirement to identify and establish a foreshore area may be granted. Examples include some small subdivisions and development applications where the proposed land use of development activity poses a, poses a significant additional risk to the waterway. In the circumstances, a standard foreshore <coughs> with that 
adequately protects the waterway may be requested. You have this... one minute left, thank you. So, sorry? You have one minute left. Oh, sorry, okay. So in, in that respect, there are extenuating circumstances um, in, in the policy, which we work with DUA, with three different um, environmental consultants, and we have developed a foreshore management plan that is that has been supported by DIVA. The management plan was was prepared in those consultations. Uh, okay, I'm going to jump to the next one. Uh, the other issue I'd like to quickly mention is that uh, we've had consultations with the uh, Aboriginal Heritage Consultation. We've had the elders, uh, Herbert Brofo and Bella Brofo on site. We did, we did the site visit and they are supportive of, of the development and the restoration to the native emu swamp, the revegetation. I have a, an agreement that's signed by them, which I will lodge together with a petition uh, with some 1,400 supportive members that will be lodged this evening. Thank you. That's your time. Thank you. I'll ask any questions, councillors. Councillor Catalano first. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, I've just got a couple of questions. Um, I sort of did an estimate and I just wanted you to confirm. Is the structure going to be about 1,250 square metres, including the kitchen? No, it's, no, it's not. So what, uh, what's the size? I was trying to work uh, out the actual square metreage. Like Together. Including the kitchen. Nine nine hundred and fifty. It's it's in the actual application and drawings. Nine hundred and fifty, and that includes the kitchen, does it? Yes. Nine hundred fifty square meters. Okay. And I was, I must have got the calculations wrong. And the other thing I want to ask is, um, who put in the utility services, the gas and the water, on that bank? I'm not privy to that. That was before my time. But was, but, but oh, hang on a minute. Because I understand there was infill on that site in 2009. And I looked at the, I was just reading about the Dewar, uh, have said that it's okay because they're, they're, you know, saying it's okay because of existing utility services. So when were those, and who put those utility services in on that site? They would have been put in um, at the time of the construction in 2012. 2012. So that would have been you, the temple? It would have been the temple. The temple put yes. them in. Right. That's That was the question I yeah. wanted to know. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Councillor Howard. Thank you very much for your deputation. Um, it mentions on page... Uh, 249 that there's been some um, waterway rehabilitation that's been undertaken. Do you have any, I haven't been able to drop by and see the site unfortunately for a little while. Um, are you able to afford any recent pictures taken of the, um, that demonstrates the waterway rehabilitation that's been undertaken as outlined by DIY? I haven't got recent ones but we did have uh, before the planting and after the planting which was uh, um, November to December. Okay, so from the clearing in February 2020. We have pictures from the clearing, yes. Okay, so you've got um, planting images, you've got some photos yes, from the from yeah. planting in December. Yeah. So you, why would you plant in December? It's the middle of summer. Uh, we started planting in, in, in autumn and spring uh, because we were waiting for the native vegetation plants to arrive. It was a special order. And when we got them, we planted them. Uh, most of them um, were planted before December. October, November, and um, we have supplied water to it as well so that they don't dry out in the summer. Okay, thank you. And I have a second question, please. Um, it doesn't state an intended use for the second story at this stage. Yeah, at this stage. I'm assuming, oh, sorry, I'm just assuming that you probably have some idea, otherwise I don't know why you'd be building it. <laughs> no, the, the reason to do that now was it, it wouldn't be feasible to do the two stories afterwards. So we do, we will want to use it in the future for uh, administration because we have no administration facilities as a library block and for religious uh, teachings for the children. Okay, but that will come as a separate application, I'm yes. assuming, at a separate Correct. time. All right, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bowman. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And following on from Councillor Allett's questions, um, if you know it's going to be for a new library block um, and whatever else, uh, why don't you put it in this application since you're building, you want to build this? We, we're not 100% sure, Councillor Roman. Um, we, we believe that that's what the needs are for the congregation. So it is highly likely to be that. The other thing was uh, financial constraints as well to fit it all out. So. so you understand that you can put a planning application in, but don't have to fit out the building. That's correct. I mean, it's not going to be used upstairs. You, do you understand the concerns of the community that not knowing what's going to be in the second story is is concerns for them? Uh, no, I wasn't aware of that. But uh, as I said, it, it is most likely to be for administration and library, so which, which is in, in keeping with the usage for the uh, religious purposes. So no, no functions or events. No, there will be no there. functions in that building at all. The downstairs is only used for uh, dining activities okay. on, on the big occasions of the feasts. And with the current dining activities, is it in the marquees that are to the west currently that's normally there? Yeah, the current dining activities occur anywhere they can just find a spot, so, uh, mostly in, in the existing shed and then that marquee, yes, that's great. Okay, thank you. I've just got a question of staff. Any other questions, councillors? Thank you for Thank your you. attendance, Narish, and your deputation answering those questions. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Councillor Bowman, you're first on staff questions. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Mr Mayor, just a question to staff about the unknown second level. Um, I'm correct and that's not common. Normally we get that information at this point in time. Is that correct? Through Mr Russell. You, Mr Mayor, yes, it's mostly the case that that proponents have a clear idea of the total use of the building when they when they apply yes. Second question, continuing on from that, uh, if this is approved, gets built, what things could that be used for? Through Mr Mayor, it could be used for, uh, subject to approval, it could be used for any of the uses that the zoning table provides for, the structure plan provides for nominally in a residential zone. Uh, uh, yes. So through you, Mr Mayor, can the manager give us some examples of what they will be? Mr Russell, if you know. Testing my memory, I, I, I tend not to memorise the zoning table. It's not necessary, but you can have, for example, looking at some of the things that you might have, um, uh, a uh, consulting rooms, the use of commercial type use you could have. Obviously, they could apply consistent with the structure plan to use this for activities that fall under the general remit of a place of, of worship, which I think from the indication from the proponents, it will be something associated with their community use. So, Mr Mayor, next question. Uh, would that approval be for such as weddings and festivals and events to be hired out to members of, of the... Um, of the, um, the members of the church? Well, through you, um, Mr Mayor, I don't believe there's anything under the current approvals for the facility as a uh, uh, community purpose, place of worship, place of worship that, that prohibits uh, a celebratory activity from occurring in a place of worship. So, so that they, they could do that now. So, Mr. Mayor, private functions by members? I draw no distinction, uh, Mr. Mayor, between a wedding or any other form of private function. So, yes, you could do it for that without approval. And, Mr. Mayor, they'd be able to hire it out? Mr. Russell, if, you, if you're aware. Uh, well, I suppose in the same way that you might hire out a church hall, if you're a member of the congregation, perhaps you might hire out this facility. Thank you. Councillor Howlett. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. I've got a question of staff. I think sort of two questions. Um, um, my first question relates to the foreshore management plan. Um, it's referred to on page 246 that the city, of, in 2021, the city approved a foreshore management plan for the um, previous development applications. I'm just wondering, is that the same foreshore management plan that's 
been proposed with this application or has there been a separate one submitted? Three, Mr Mayor. No, that's for the Bennett Brook proper. This is a tributary of the brook. So the north-south vegetated section of the site, when it was originally, the application originally came in, that is the foreshore management plan we're referencing. The foreshore management plan that's been the topic of consideration is the foreshore management plan for this tip, tributary portion that runs east-west. So it's a different foreshore management plan as it's referenced in the report. Thank you. And further to that, so being that there's two foreshore management plans, um, the one that is related to um, that D would change their mind from um, change their um, from opposing to supporting the proposal, following the applicant working with them on a foreshore management plan, that would be um, that would be the foreshore management plan that you're suggesting is goes ahead in the recommendations under 1D and 1E, would that be correct, Mr? When you're ready, Mr. Russell. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, in relation to the recommendation, condition, recommended condition four, condition five, Uh, relate to the foreshore management plan for the east-west section of the tributary of the Bennett Brook. Uh, that, is, that is what these conditions are referring to, yes. Is that all, Councillor Howard? Um, not really, but I'll follow up in a separate email to Mr Russell. Thank you, Councillor Catalano. And I had one further question, Mr Mayor. Ah. Sorry. Please continue, Councillor Howard. Thank you. So, Councillor Catalano, um, this relates to the um, non-native trees that were planted to, to on the verge to address the visual impact of the proposal. Um, just wanting to know that if the city if the city paid for these thirty three non-native hibiscus tillaceous trees to be planted, um, Mr. Marin, if such, is it possible to get the total cost of this planting inclusive of the trees, the labour, and the watering for two years? I think that might be a question for Mr. Jackawina. You can take it on notice if you haven't got that. Yeah, then I can, can confirm the city did pay for it. Uh, the total cost, I'll have to get back to you on that one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Catalano. Thank you. Yes, I'd like a copy of the cost of those trees as well. Thank you. Um, yes, please. Um, okay, for Mr. Russell. Um, this this that where this development here is uh, determining uh, uh, like it's a discretion that we're uh, considering in terms of this site. It's it's zoned residential, and the discretion is for it to be used as a place of worship. Is that correct? Uh, to be precise, Mr. Mayor, the zoning, of course, as the report says, is residential development. Uh, and it's subject to a structure plan, one of our older structure plans, as many of the councillors would understand. Um, and yes, it's quite true that the structure plan indicates this site as being residential, and it also depicts a nominal reservation or public open space or foreshore area across the um, the tributary of the Bennett Brook and the Bennett Brook proper. So what we look at there, the thing about the zoning table is in our scheme it will say, let the permissibility of the land uses are set out as per a structure plan. So the zoning table will just have more or less a notation that says see structure plan. The structure plan depicts the nominal zoning of pure residential, uh, but the place of worship you can um, you can have you can have in there, uh, and that is actually in a residential zone. The place of worship is a fair use of discretion is not a fair use, which means it's as of right. Uh, the nature of the use is as of right. Yeah. It's a use, so yes, it's quite correct. The, the, that, that means it's not permissible unless the council has exercised its discretion to grant approval. Which the Correct. Exercise did. Thank you for that. So what we actually are considering is, in fact, a discretionary use for this building as a place of worship, not as a residential. Uh, and so, in fact, a lot of the conditions relating to residential use don't apply because what we're actually considering with this motion is it being used as a place of worship. Is that correct? That's true enough. This is a, this is a 
building there is an extension to an existing place of worship on the land. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Um, and with the foreshore management plan, do we know if that's going to meet the standards of a Class A forest, as uh, DBCA have indicated uh, should be done? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, no, I would suggest you probably have to stop short of that, um, but uh, because if you were to have at, at that level, uh, obviously there might be implications with respect to the level of bushfire risk. So. You know, you, the, the foreshore management plan will need to be developed up to balance the type and density of planting for revegetation uh, to a level that isn't going to exacerbate or produce an unacceptable bushfire risk on the building. Okay, and finally, sorry, I just have to ask you to confirm, please, the um, size in terms of square metres of the um, the whole structure, because. I just can't understand. I mean, the kitchen itself is 440 metres squared and I sort of did some calculations. So I, I just would like you to confirm what the whole meterage, square meterage is of the structure, including the kitchen. And uh, with all due respect to the answer I received, I just, I just need to kind of have that confirmed because it's not gelling in my mind. Sorry. If I take councillors to page 258, um, 258 of the agenda, you've got a plan that shows proposed building areas and it's got ground floor building. This is, this is the proponents. I think the we will, we will, was mentioned in the report, but in relation to the plans as the applicant has submitted, it's got ground floor building equals 904 square metres. Veranda equals 84 square metres. Upper floor, including voids and balconies, 712. So that proposed building area comes to 1,701 square metres, as indicated in the table on the applicant's plan, Mr Mayor. Sorry. I mean, you know, uh, does that include the kitchen? The 440 metres for the kitchen? Proposed building areas, I would, I, I, it doesn't say so, but I would expect looking at uh, total I mean, will include the whole lot. That's the kitchen, that little building, uh, just to the south of mm. that larger building, and they apparently that's four hundred and forty square meters. Uh, yeah, looks, that's that's right. And it doesn't look half the size of the big building. Volumes are a tricky thing, Mr. Mayor. The dimensions, well, the, the, the no. people that produce these use CAD programs. No, I mean, it's and... fairly clear that there's some error in the calculations that have been given to me. So, would you mind clarifying with me exactly? And I don't really need to know. I'll have the applicant do it, Mr. Mayor. It's not for me to dispute the, the, the drafting calculations of a CAD program. Oh, okay. Thanks very much. Yes, thank you. Any other questions, councillors? Councillor Knight. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just uh, for Mr. Russell. Can any further development take place on this site, or is it um, is that pretty much it now? Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I understood the question back to be will or was it can? Yes, is it is it possible? Can they can they continue? Yeah, yes, it's, it is possible for the on, applicant to make an application for further expansion on this site. Yes, on the other side of the tributary or build a bridge, maybe, and things like that. Well, the three, Mr. Mayor, um, they would. In theory, it's possible for someone to propose a private bridge linking across a waterway to um, the public realm. Uh, I don't know whether that's in the applicant's uh, intentions, but that would go through another process. Any other questions, councillors? Thank you. Um, I also note there's a written deputation uh, from Alan and Kay Bag Bagini, not in support of the officer's recommendation. That takes us to part C of the agenda, and there are new reports in that part. And now item 6.3, are there any other questions with regards to any other items in the agenda? Councillor Parry. I've got three very quick questions, if you don't mind, Mr Mayor. Uh, this is to the planning staff, if that's okay, in regards to 13.3 proposed extension to the Tavern in Balladura. Uh, can you please advise if this application has been modified yet? And if so, when do we expect it back to council? 
Mr Russell. Through you, Mr Mayor, I was only just this week speaking with the proponents and remarking it's been sitting fellow on the other business for some time and they are happy for us to represent it as is and they'll accept the, um, they'll, 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 they're happy to have the council determine the application without further ado. Google. Second question. Second question is, this is to the uh, finance staff, that's okay. Can I please have a reconciliation of the project Albert Street drainage project 300,000 between the budget and actual next week, if that's okay? Did you get that question? Yep. Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes. Yep. Beautiful, we'll thank you. Yeah, number three. Number three, this is in regards to Nangara Road project. Can staff please advise if they've gone back to the state government and federal government for additional grant funding due to the over expenditure in the report? Mr. Jacqueline. I'll take that one on notice. Last one as well, sorry, to continue on. Are there, how many more commitments, financial commitments are there for that project and how much, how much have we completed for that, if that's okay? I'll take that on notice as well, please. That Councillor, is all. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Councillor Howlett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just um, one question relating to item 13.1, South Guildford replacement BMX track. Is it possible to get an update from staff with regards to the Great Eastern Highway bypass project and the location of a suitable site for the um, community of South Guildford? Mr. Jack Arena. Yes, then we will take that on notice. Any other questions, Councillor Bowman? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First question, Mr. Mayor, is item 4.4. Um, can the Exec Director of Planning um, advise what would be consistent with the aspects of Allenbrook Town Centre for uh, Centre Development Plan for that location? And I was, was the intent for such a prominent location in the Town Centre when at time of writing to be a 7-Eleven petrol station? Mr. Van <laughs> Mr. May, the, the objectives of the um, town centre plan for Allenbrook basically allows for town centre, typical town centre developments, and a service station with a, with a 7 Eleven included in that is not un uncommon in, um, in town centres, although that type of use obviously doesn't support high density residential and the rest of, of, of um, development that you normally see within a, in a town centre, but it's certainly a use that can be accommodated in a town centre generally. And next question is uh, the impacts on residential amenities when it's not within, it's within the buffer zone, uh, I think it's 200 metres, but we know there's a lot of properties within that. Is it satisfactory to condition such things as 2.4 metre acoustic walls uh, or is that an indication that there is other issues? Mr May, if I may defer that to Mr Russell, he's um, looked into that specifically. Thank you. When you're ready, Mr Russell. Thank you, Mr May, it's for you. Um, the, if the question is, is it problematic to mitigate noise impact from a 24-hour facility by providing uh, acoustic walls. The answer to that, I suppose, in a with a surrounding residential environment, of course, is going to depend on two things, the scale of the wall and whether or not those on the other side of the wall share a boundary have any particular issue with the presentation of that wall in terms of their visual amenity. So it's not a wall of 2.4 metres is not at all uncommon. In fact, our planning scheme allows walls on certain boundaries to the rear of properties to be up to 2.4 metres. So I would say that a wall of 2.4 metres is consistent and not inconsistent with the type of residential amenity that you would expect uh, um, a wall like this to, to, to meet. Mr. Mayor, the next question on that same item, uh, Page 222 of the report talks about the design panel <clears throat> is broadly supportive of the development type in this location, acknowledging that while not the most appealing of buildings, it meets the community needs. Why is the development, why is the design panel talking about community needs? Through Mr. Mayor, because community is one of the 10 
design elements in the state planning policy. And when the government introduced this, it gave this policy and these panels a very wide remit, deliberately so to improve the quality of the built environment across Western Australia. Mr Mayor, the next question on that item is regarding the access. I understand that the report talks about, we can look at that later on. Um, is that a plausible option? And the fact that it seems there's significant traffic movement issues with this development. Mr Russell. Through Mr Mayor, the staff of the city were very adamant on review that it was not prepared to allow the original proposal for a break in the median of Main Street. And so we made it very plain to the proponent that if they were going to, to contemplate a service station in this location, they were not going to be permitted to make a median break into Main Street and that would limit the access arrangements to left in and left out. And that is, uh, so they've got, they've got a, their proposal is cognizant of the clear restrictions in terms of access, particularly with the roundabout here. So that's, that's and we're, we're satisfied that the location of the access crossovers and the nature of their limitations in terms of vehicle movements uh, will not have an impairment and will be consistent with the expectation for traffic management. And Mr Mayor, the final question on that item, is there any other examples in the Allenbrook or surrounding areas where access to such a, a site would have such close proximity to a roundabout? I'm probably looking at the uh, Director of Engineering. Very, Mr Mayor. Um, I can't think of a specific Allenbrook example, but I could, there have been many examples in recent memory of applications, not necessarily for service stations, but for commercial uses where what is required is for the crossover location to be the required, uh, consistent with the requirements for the separation distance to the, to the edge of the tangent of the, uh, of, the, of the roundabout. Mr Mayor, my next is on item 6.3. Mr Mayor, can it explain to me why that property was UV, 200 square metres? And my second follow-up question, is there more than one property that we've got an issue with? Uh, can you refer me to a page number, Councillor Bowman? Uh, 355. Thanks, Councillor Jones. 6.3, change in basis, valuation. Um, I'll direct that to our finance staff, but um, they may or may not know. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, can we take that on notice and we'll provide the feedback. Mr Mayor, can I ask, are there any other properties? Because this one was zoned residential but was rated UV, which in my 20 years experience is quite rare. Uh, are there any other properties in Bullsbrook of this size that have been rated incorrectly? Do you know that um, question or will you take it on notice? Uh, through you, Mr Mayor, we'll take that on notice. Mr Mayor, my follow-up question to that is how long has this property been rated incorrectly and what is the <laughs> loss of rate income to the City of Swan? I think once again... Through you, Mr Mayor, we'll, we'll take that on notice. Mr Mayor, there's no point in me asking any more questions on that one. I'll go to next the late item, um, which is 3.5, I believe, now. Mr Mayor... Why does there need to be such an expensive venue uh, for the running of this facility? Mr Bishop. Thank you, Mr Mayor. So I can you have the question repeated? Why was there such an why, expensive Why does there need to be such an expensive venue and, and for that matter, such a big venue to run this service? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, obviously, there's been a historical use of the venue. Um, the venue and the operator is in, in a slightly unusual situation to many other arts providers in this space in that they're providing a com they are operating under a commercial lease. Um, um, the lease rate they pay is the commercial rate. Mr Mayor, what's been the percentage increase from the last five, six years that the city has provided for the running of the Allenbrook Arts Centre to this community organisation? 
Um, Bishop, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'll take that on notice, but there, I can certainly confirm there has been a significant increase. Mr. Mayor, the increase, uh, potential increase in funding, has that been included in the draft budget that was part of the consideration at Special Council meeting last night for setting or advertising the rates? Um, the option that the city staff are recommending be approved by council is covered by what we budgeted for at the moment. So 400,000 is in the draft budget. Mr. Mayor, the report talks about uh, the budget amount of being 250,000, but however, council passed a resolution to increase that fee. Uh, have that not been amended in the budget at draft at mid-year budget review time? Uh, just a slight through you, Mr. Mayor. Just a slight correction. I think it was two hundred and fifty thousand, and then council increased it by forty thousand to two ninety, um, uh, as part of the resolution last year. Um, and the budget reallocation is still coming through. Is still coming through the system. So um, at this date, it's not showing, but it is in progress. Mr. Mayor, can I ask a question? Why does a budget allocation reallocation take that long? Uh, that should have happened already, is my understanding, and Councillor Parry's look on his face probably concurs with me. I would have to take you on notice in regards to why there's been a delay in that coming through. Mr Mayor, if it was 250000 plus 40000 increase, why has the total expenditure been 317000 to date? And what reason? Um, through you, Mr Mayor, I will confirm this by email because I may not explain it exactly right but it's to do with some other funding that came into the same account for arts program um, and the expenditure against that. Um, that can be reconciled, but it would be best to bet if I take it on notice just to make sure I can provide an accurate answer for Council Bowman. Mr Mayor, in the report, the applicant talks about uh, using some of the space to hire it out to community groups. Uh, is this a art centre service we're providing for? or are we actually subsidising a group to lease out part of a building to community groups? Uh, the funding is for an art service program service delivery. Mr Mayor, is the increase in, in the commercial rate because they've taken on a larger lease space to allow this to happen? Uh, certainly a part of the increase over the last few years relates to the fact that they've taken over a larger floor space and that was covered in the council report from last year. Mr Mayor, the increase in costs from 250 to 290 to 400, just roughly what sort of percentage increase to rates for all City of Swan residents would that be? Mr Bishop? I would take that on notice because I'd probably defer to the finance staff to confirm that. I'll leave it at that, Mr Mayor. Thank you. And if you can provide all those questions, Councillor Bowman. I saw that start writing down. Uh, I've, already, I've already committed a whole lot and it's just a follow-on. It just makes it easier to get the answers done in a timely manner. Councillor Catalano. Uh, yes, thanks. Would you mind uh, providing those answers to Councillor Bowman's questions uh, to me as well, perhaps other councillors as well? But the, the main concern I have is that I don't have a copy of what he was referring to um when was that is that in my pigeonhole or that didn't come with the agenda did it it's a supplementary agenda yeah uh we normally have a supplementary on the table in front of us for tonight oh oh sorry i didn't see that one but i always want a paper copy yeah okay well I always want a paper copy. So um, if, it, if there's any more of these supplementaries, because I'm working, I've been working the last two days and I really um, don't have means to check emails before I come to meetings. Uh, so, you know, if could I get a copy of, a hard copy of those um, new items for collection tomorrow? No, but I, I like to have the hard copy so that I can refer it to. Yeah, thanks. Could I pick it up tomorrow afternoon? Oh, great. Thank you so much for that. Cheers. Thank you. Any other questions, Councillor Knight? Just one. Thanks, Mayor. Um, it's just been brought to my attention that uh, there are some signs going up about dogs uh, 
that must be unleashed during sporting activities. Um, part of the dog review, um, can you elaborate, can you enlighten uh, what's happening with the review and etc.? Uh, Mr. Bishop, through you, for Mr. Mayor, um, I would need to know the location. Uh, uh, and perhaps you could email that question okay. through. It's not part of the agenda tonight, Councillor okay. Knight. We're just asking questions on the agenda. I'll ask, are there any other questions on the agenda, councillors? Councillor Johnson, you have any questions? No. Thank you. Um, well, councillors, um, if anyone's intending to move any amendments or alternative motions for next week's uh, ordinary council meeting, please liaise with the appropriate uh, officers and um, email them as soon as you can within the, to meet the time frames to both the CEO and meeting requests so the minute clerk can have a copy of them. I thank everyone, particularly those in the public gallery who have stayed to the end. Um, you want to hand that uh, petition in, Mr Patel? Thank you. I'll come... We'll, staff will get that off you shortly. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone for attending and I declare the meeting open at 10 past 8. Thank you very much. Open at Thank you.